Let's ask God's blessing on our time this morning. And uh, let's hope he feeds us well spiritually. Father, again, the privilege to come into your most holy presence. Uh, we have no righteousness of our own, so we, we come in the righteousness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we've trusted as our personal Lord and Savior, not only believing who he is and what he's done, but actually receiving him into our heart to run our lives, to guide us, and uh, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, which you give to every believer, believers at the instant that they trust you. We trust in his finished work on the cross of Calvary. He came to earth. He took on uh, God, taking on the flesh of sinful man, living a sinless life for 33 years, going to the cross of Calvary, bearing our sins in his body, shedding his precious blood to pay full atonement for our sins, being buried raised the third day, ascends up into heaven, sits at your right hand, making intercession for us now as our great high priest. And Father, now we look for his soon return as he will come to take his church off this earth and then seven years later come in, in great majesty and glory as Lord of Lord and King of Kings to reign for a thousand years. All of that, uh, Lord, uh, is, is unfolding before our very eyes these days. Uh, your word is, is true. Your word is accurate in every way. And as we look into it this morning, we'd ask, Lord, that you prepare our hearts to be fed from it, that you'd have a message for each of us. It's spiritual food. We need to not only take it in, but digest it and apply it to our lives. We thank you for this time. Together we can do without fear of persecution. Pray for Bill and uh, for others in our park and our, uh, that are in spiritual needs at this hour. We pray for our church family, our family and friends, all that need Christ. For without Christ, there's no hope in eternity. He is the only path to eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And so, Father, just to use this time this morning to bring the word forth. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You get going. So last week, again, we, we covered a number of things. And I'm not going to do what I did last week going back over... Uh, uh, let's see, we ended on uh, verse 19. I'll pick it up there. But we talked about much of how pe the, 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 how the church, the, the true church, ha it deals with people that come in need, in particular women, in particularly widows, that the discernment that has to go on. We use the word vetting. I think vetting has to do with horse racing. I, you know, it's, there's betting and then there's vetting. I think this has a lot to do with the checking out the animal and things. Well, we're not animals. We're made in the image of God. And the world has forgotten that. They are now making animals equal with man. That is totally an inaccurate thing to do, but that's the way the sinful heart tends to lean. And so we pick up in verse 19 on page 69. You should have that. Against an elder received not an accusation, but, between, but before two or three witnesses. And so this is a very practical book. I mean, there's, there's, there's wonderful miracles in here and things to, to show that God's great power. Where there's, uh, there's things in here that show God's great mercy and his, and his long suffering with us. But there's also practical things in here for believers uh, within the church today, how they're to deal with one another. And in every church, there are problems. If you've got a big church, you have lots of problems. If you have a small church, you have some problems and maybe lots of problems, comparatively speaking. But every church has its issues to deal with. And so he's, he's warning Timothy. He's guiding Timothy. He's equipping Timothy to tell him, you're going into war. You're going into a spiritual battle, not a physical one. But you're going to have all these different things to have to deal with. And there's a right way to deal with them. And there's a wrong way to deal with them. And the right way is God's way. And so he's giving, he's talking here now against an elder received, not an accusation. That, what's an accusation? That's, we, we see that every, on television all day long. People accusing, accusing, making accusations on other people. They did this. They did it for this reason or that reason. No, that's a lie. It's, and it goes on and on and on. So Lamentations uh, tells us there's what? Nothing new under the sun? And I, you know, not, not the Lamentations, but the Ecclesiastes. 
there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, you know, and, and so it goes on all the time. Now it's spread worldwide in an instant. And so the accusations needed to be confirmed. God says, don't take one sinful man's <laughs> word against another sinful man. You need, you need witnesses. You need two or three witnesses on that accusation. And so, and especially against an elder, somebody who's been, well, probably of some age, but maybe, uh, maybe it's referring to the pastor. Pastors are always under attack. Uh, our pastor has to deal with a lot of things he does not share with, with his general, with the general church. He just deals with them. And the people are accused, you know, and I've seen it happen, the accusations in the church. And it gets, you know, and that's why we're cautioned against gossiping because the gossip can turn to, into something really ugly and you wind up with a church split, which happens very frequently. Every time you get a new pastor in the church, there's an opportunity for a division to occur. And Satan is right there ready to widen that division. If he can drive the wedge in, he'll do it uh, with great subtlety. Deuteronomy 17.6, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses. That doesn't mean you can have four. Two are absolutely necessary. Three is better. But if you got four or five, that's okay too. At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. So, you know, in the Old Testament, justice was, was severe and justice was meted out timely. We've, our, our, our Constitution, our laws say that a person is entitled to a speedy trial. That never happens anymore. Speedy is in years now. And it's, it's, it's a business. It's a business for the lawyers. It just drags on and on and on and on and on. And so it's, it's a business. You see it on TV all the time. It used to be beer cigarette ads now. Now it's lawyer ads. And they come one after another, one after another. They almost, I was listening to them, they're almost encouraging people to have accidents. You know, subtle, we, we, we are the biggest and we'll get you the biggest settlements. You know, and people are so lustful about money. And they're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why don't we just, you know, tap the brakes here and let that f person in the back, you know, and then we'll call you and you or, or old Dan, you, you know, who I'm, you know who I'm talking about. You see it every day. There's something wrong with that. Every preacher, preacher and teacher of the truth of the Bible are in short... In the short passage of time, is going to is going to raise up opposite the the truth. If it's preached, will separate people. Uh, most people have itchy ears, and so if you just get, tell them th things they want to hear, or tell them how good they are, or or even encourage them to do certain things, uh, they're satisfied with that, and, and it, they've they've enjoyed the message, and they go home and go their way. But if you tell them that they're living a sinful life and they're, without Christ they're damned and they're going to hell and that their, their lifestyle as a Christian is not consistent with their salvation, if you tell them that, then they get angry. And, 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 sh and it should make us think. You know, for a true believer, it should make us think. Am I, is that really, is he talking to me? No, he's talking to the person next to me. I, I would, you know... And so the truth really divides people. And we see that today in our, in our culture. The truth divides. People are sinful. And that word, they refuse to use that word. They call it a mental health. When your body is cut, it bleeds. Your, your soul, you know, your, your spirit doesn't bleed. Neither does your soul. Mental, there's not, really not, there's no such thing as mental health. Because you can't cure it. You, there's no medicine for it. Well, there is medicine for it. It's called the gospel. And it's called the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross. And, and that is the only medicine that will change the individual. Psalm 117, verse 2, the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we need to be de dealing out as the truth. In verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. 
I think the idea here is that public sin re requires a public rebuke. If the pastor gets up, or any church, not necessarily our church, any church, a Bible-believing church, and the pastor gives out something that is doctrinally totally incorrect and, and heretical, then that person needs to be rebuked in public. Everybody that heard that heresy needs to understand that it was a heresy. Isn't that what Paul did to Peter? Peter was a hypocrite, a public hypocrite. He was eaten with the Gentiles, which was great. And when the Jews showed up at the door, he gets up and moves the seats from them. And Paul stood him up and called him a hypocrite. Publicly. Peter, yeah. And so that them, them that sin before all, remember every word is important, before all, that others may fear. Rebuke before all. And so, you know, we don't necessarily have to get up in church and confess our sins in front of everybody. But if we sin in public or in the church, and sometimes there gets to be these relationships in the church that are ungodly, that requires, that's a public rebuke there. People don't want to do that. People don't want to repent. They'd rather change churches and, prevent and, and hide it. It's wrong. And, and it'll all be brought to light when we meet Christ. Verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one be, before another. Do nothing by partiality. <laughs> we, live, we live in a culture where everything is partiality. If, you know, this, if you're this of this thing, it's, this, you know, it's all partiality. And so, you know, the word objective, it's all, everything is subjective. And Paul emphasizes that, uh, let's see, he says, I charge thee here. Th this phrase has the idea of, of Paul exhorting Timothy. It's not really an option. And Paul emphasizes that he's doing it in the witness of God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. No, I don't, the elect angels, that's kind of a, interesting, but that's not the focus. The elect angels here refer to, I believe, the holy angels in heaven. And again, our, things in heaven, everything in heaven, I, in my understanding, should be holy. So I don't know how Satan gets to get there as, every once in a while before, the, before God, but he does. We know that happens because he is, what? The accuser of the brethren. So there's some things about that we don't uh, that I don't understand. Maybe you do. I don't. Matthew 20, 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his work. So I think those are the holy angels being referred to, the ones that did not uh, abandon or go with Lucifer, uh, Satan, and. Uh, let us pause here to consider why elect angels need to even be mentioned in this context. We see that all three witnesses are holy and, in, and are in heaven. It is true that the saints there are in paradise, but the resurrection of the saints has not occurred. Nor have we appeared before the judgment seat of Christ for those things that are, that are not done in the body following our salvation. So. You know, we are, we are elect. We, we're, if you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're elect, chosen of God, chosen unto uh, redemption, chosen unto what? Ch children. I mean, so many things happen to you when you receive Christ as your, as your Lord and Savior. Not only are your sins forgiven, but you, you get eternal life. You get citizenship in heaven. You, get, you, you become part of God's family. We call the sons of God. Now are you the sons of God? And we did not appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we shall be like him as he is. We get new bodies. We, oh, there's so many things we, 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 we get when we, we receive Christ as Savior. And, but, and so are the saints in heaven, uh, are the, are the, those in paradise, seeing all this going on? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's so, but well, we don't know. So we don't want to read anything in or or make any really strong statement about things that are not mentioned at all. And so, let me see where I went. It is true that the saints are in paradise, but the resurrection hasn't occurred yet. And so uh, we look with, with great appreciation to the Lord, the God-man, our, uh, 
our daysman. He's, he's the daysman between us and the Lord. Job so wanted a daysman in his day. And he's our high priest. He makes intercession for us uh, to the Father. And so uh, our, uh, he, and as our God, as our God, he's also our perfect judge. He's going to judge us. There will be no excuses. No one at either this judgment or the great white throne judgment will be able to say, I don't know what you, what I had to deal with. You don't know what, you know, I'm saying excuses, people. You don't know what I have to deal with. Or you don't know the burdens I bear. Or you don't know the pain and suffering I had to endure and the hardships. I'm so sorry. None of that will be a valid excuse at either the great white, either at the judgment seat of Christ for things that uh, we as Christians we should ha or should not have done, nor for the lost at the great white, uh, the great white throne judgment. There's not going to be any excuses. You know, most of our trials today are filled with people making excuses. Yeah. And, and mental health is the thing. I wasn't myself at that when I did all, you know, all of this goes on and on and on. And so he knows. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And Hebrews 4.15, for we, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings or infirmities but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. All of Paul's witnesses were holy, thus completely reliable, so, you know, reliable that are mentioned here, reliable witnesses. And so he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that they'll observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partial, partiality, without preferring one another. Timothy, avoid partiality in everything that you do. Uh, there are a great number of areas by which we discriminate upon, among people. That, discrimination is ne not necessarily partiality. We discriminate uh, when we hire somebody for a job. We ask them about their skill sets and their experience and the name of their employer so that we can you know, do, uh, do a back check. That's, that's discriminating. But that's not necessarily showing partiality. Uh, wh what club do you belong to? Oh, you belong to that club? You're in. That's partiality for hiring. So there's a difference between we need to, we need to be a discriminating people in certain areas, but we should not show partiality. In our society, the word discriminate is almost always a negative word. Discrimination is always, almost always used in, in the negative sense. And so, uh, but it, it's, Timothy is to discriminate, remember, to discriminate regarding the widows. They were to be checked on. That's discrimination. And so you do not want your, 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 you do not want your surgeon to be, to, do you, okay, excuse me, do you not want your surgeon to be trained and judged competent to operate or just someone off the street? who puts on a set of green scrubs and washes his or her hands. No, you discriminate. When you, when you go into the hospital and you go for, maybe go for surgery, sometimes you get to choose who your surgeon will be. And, uh, you know, you see somebody come in, looks about 18 years old, you know. He's got a scrub top on. He's got jeans and sandals on. You're not really sure you want him to be the one doing the cutting and the sewing, right? You know, so we, we discriminate, and, and that's good. Uh, but Timothy is being advised to be careful not to do it for the wrong reasons. You know, uh, don't show favoritism. Every area of human interaction is, is tainted with this sin, showing favoritism. In the first church I was in, the pastor there, who I love dearly, and I know he loved me, but he did not make close he didn't make buddies of the people in the church. He made friends of them. He would do anything for them. He loved them. He prayed for them. He preached to them. He taught to them. He would have fellowship with them. But he didn't hang around with them. He, they, 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 they didn't, he, he, and he told me one time, he says, I don't want people to think that I'm showing favoritism to her. And he didn't. If you were doing something, you know, he thought was spiritually wrong, he would tell you about it. 
and he'd expect you to correct it. And I think that's what being guided here, because there were people that when Timothy would get there would just love Timothy. And then there were people that maybe would challenge him as to his authority or as his accuracy or things like that. And, and uh, you know, he, he, they, he wasn't to show favoritism with regard to either one of those. It was regard to, with regard to the ministry. Paul's directive is strictly uh, 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 getting off where it should be here. But uh, don't show favoritism every year. And, and we know in our, in our culture, I mean, favoritism. Look how we dealt with the change of government here. <laughs> you're off the committee. You're off the committee. You're off the committee. You're on. You're on. And it's, it's favoritism going you know, and back and forth. And, and we've come to expect it and to, and to uh, and deal with it. He says, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Uh, laying on of, uh, suddenly on no man. The laying on of hands, I believe, has to do with the ordaining of men for church office or missionary work. It's not like Hollywood's version where you get sparks and thunder and lightning coming out of the fi end of the fingers. It's not about that. It's about a, it's, as baptism is a public identification with the death, burial, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the laying on of hands is a, is a physical and public acknowledgement that you are considering the person upon whom the hands are being laid to be competent and equipped to do some service for the Lord, maybe as a missionary or as a teacher. And it wasn't just a public thing. I've been part of that two or three times in, in the decades that I've been saved. It's not, not real common anymore. But if you have a missionary going out from your church, sometimes you can have what they call an ordination ceremony, which doesn't make the individual any smarter. It doesn't give him, him or her any more spiritual gifts. All it does is a, a public way identification by the church that this individual is qualified and motivated and spiritually equipped to go and do this service for the Lord and we concur and we're sending them and we're going to support them maybe with our prayers and often with our finances. And that's what an ordination ceremony is. So people ask, are you ordained? It's meaningless because a lot of people are sent by churches that are not qualified. It's meaningless. It's, it should be not be it should not be a qualification for service. It's how much you know about this book and how you live for Christ that's important. Well, I didn't mean to get so far off of that. So I view the laying on of hands as a public identification of the individual and the approval of the church leadership of that person for some office. When the pulpit is vacant, uh, it, there can be a, an impatience to fill it without due diligence. And so sometimes pastors will say, I'm retiring, or, or they may get sick and not be able to come back and, and do the job. And, and, and there's an, ex an urgency to fill that pulpit with that vein. You've got to be careful about doing that. You've got to do your due diligence. And so, uh, and so you, you're going to have to discriminate. And so no matter what the initial impression or the credentials presented of the, uh, with the letter of recommendation, Paul says, lay hands suddenly on no man. A very good, very good counsel in a very short sentence. Even a person qualified for the position may not be right for the church. You got, you know, even, uh, even if, if great care and diligence are practiced, the results may still be unsatisfactory. I mean, you just don't know the heart of people God does. And sometimes people get in positions and things go well for a while and then their true colors are revealed and they're maybe heretics. They may not believe in the deity of Christ or they may not believe in the manhood. Something else. But these decisions made in, uh, are made in haste and the opportunity for pro problems increases if you lay hands on somebody suddenly. Neither be partakers of other men's sins. Now what, now, what could that be? There is no reason not to believe this phrase has to do with the preceding, the laying on of the hands. A hasty ordination, 
of a person who turns out to be dishonest or heretical would in a sense be participating in their sins because of the failure to do due diligence. If you don't do your job in picking the person, doing the best you can and following the rules, and you pick somebody quickly and that person's a heretic, okay, you are responsible, have some responsibility for this heretical teaching that's going on because you didn't do your job in the first place. You cannot adequately tell, tell the character of a candidate from the preaching of one or two sermons and the teaching of one or two Sunday school classes. And we know that at our church because we have, have evidence of that happening. Somebody looked like they were going to be dynamite in the ministry and they are gone. We, we, we're too anxious sometimes to, to put people in positions that they, they don't belong in. And they can do a lot of damage. In Second John chapter 11, for he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. <laughs> you don't wish, you don't wish heretics, Mormons come to your door, Jehovah's Witnesses. You don't, when they leave, you don't tell them have a great day. You don't want them to have a great day. You don't want you want evil to happen to them, but you don't want their their heresy and their and their false doctrine to be received by anybody. Uh, or bid them Godspeed. May God be with Please, no, that you don't want to do that. And that's the idea here. Keep you, thyself pure, <laughs> he's telling Timothy. Not only in this particular area, but in every area of the ministry and private life. Clean living, chaste, modest, modest and, and mature. That word perfect has the idea of mature. Verse 23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and often... Infirmities. Well, this is not the verse that you go to to talk, say that drinking of alcohol and strong drink and getting drunk is acceptable. Uh, there are there are well. Let me read what I got here. It is widely reported that wine, undistilled, contains elements that aid in the, the digestive practice, process. And there are a lot of people who drink wine and don't do it to excess. You go to a country like uh, France or Italy. Or other countries where the water, you know, we, we open up the tap, put the glass in, turn off the tap, put the water to our mouth, and down the, we don't even think about it. You can't do that in every country. In some countries, the, the water system, you just don't drink it from the tap. When Marge and I were, I was in the Navy, in Italy, we were in Italy in, in the mid-60s. She made a trip over and met me and uh, flew down from Rome to Naples, and we spent about uh, seven to ten days, you know, touring a we didn't drink any of the water out of the tap. We didn't drink any tap water. You drank, you drank, you know. And so it was widely reported. Therefore, Paul's directive is strictly for health reasons, for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. So Timothy, a young man, he, he's got physical problems. Why didn't Paul heal him? I get talked to that. Paul had the ability to heal people. Why didn't he heal them? You see, those, those spiritual gifts of healing and things were given for specific purposes, not as a general capability. He didn't heal them. He was to, he was to go into the ministry and deal with that, and God's grace was going to be what, what he had. And so, Timothy... Paul was telling Timothy, is, I do not believe that Paul was telling Timothy never to drink water again, but at least for the period of time for, he was, had a problem. The word translated a little is the Greek word oligos and has a time meaning such as briefly for a while. There's a time meaning to that, to that word. So it's uh, for a while, a, a season. So we should not view this verse in the same way we would view taking drugs that, we, we should view this verse in the same way we would view taking drugs after an operation or because of sickness. It says on the bottle, you know, 30 tablets, take two a day, no refills. Okay, and that's the idea here with the wine. Take it until your stomach feels better and then stop. And I don't know, you know, in those days they could, some, they could drink the water and, you know, their systems were such that they could handle it. Yeah, we, the more drugs we use, the less our body builds up immunities on its own. 
There's absolutely no reason, reason to dwell on this verse and to try to extract a biblical authority for recreational use of alcohol. It's just not there. Acts 28, 8. And it came to pass that the father of Publius, the sick, lay of, sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. But he didn't heal Timothy, did he? No indication he did that. So why did he heal Publius? This, this guy here, Publius, well, it was for, if it was for the, uh, the furtherance of the gospel. There are other of Paul's company that he did not heal or attempt to heal. These miracles were for specific reasons and not a general capability. Verse 24, some men's sins are, are open beforehand and, and going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. So it took a little while in looking at that for what does that mean? Some sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment. These last two verses continue to deal with the issue of appointing, I believe, to appointing men to leadership positions and other positions of responsibility in the local church. I believe they're still tied to this business of choosing church leadership. Some considered for leadership in the church and have in their past sins that would disqualify them for such positions. And so, but, but if they have confessed those sins to forgiveness in Jesus Christ, then the sins are forgiven. And some men, after they follow after, these are those with, whole, with no new disqualifying sins in the past, but are then revealed after they are in church office. So, I think here again, the idea of doing due diligence. You find out that somebody, there, there are many great preachers that, that pre, of recent times and some, uh, that have, all have sinful past. And some have even, you know, had really agreed, done things that uh, would normally you wouldn't want them in the pulpit. But they, they repented of them and they were forgiven of them and they paid for them. And they've turned to Christ. I mean, Paul was a murderer. See, that was something in the past. Would you have, as a, the Lord chose Paul, would you have chosen Paul? I don't think we would have chosen Paul. Even if he changed his mind. But God chose him. Because God had a, a purpose for them. We would not have chosen him. If he was a candidate for the apostles, of the, what, did, what did Peter tell uh, when Judas they were praising him for Judas. What did he tell the people? Choose you good men who are with the Lord all. That was, that was the, the, the discrimination going on. That was the discernment. And, and so they, they chose two and picked one. How about if Paul had been a third in that? <laughs> Even though he said, I've trusted Christ. I'm not going to do it anymore. Would they have picked? They would not have picked Paul. So I think that's talking about the sins that before the choosing them and then sins that are not known beforehand and the person is chosen. And now you've got sins, you've got a person in, 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 the, in a position of church leadership or in ministry who is now sinned after they've been chosen for these things. That's why lay hands on no man suddenly. This is just some of the reason why. And so some men, they follow after. These are those with no, new, no known disqualifying sins in their past, but are then revealed after they are in the church office. And then and Paul then gives out a couple of examples here in another letter. 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and departed for Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, this man Demas was a disciple of Paul. He, was a, he appears to have traveled with Paul. He's mentioned in other letters before this situation here happened. He's mentioned in other, he was with Paul. He was being taught by Paul. He was fellowshipping with Paul. He was eating with Paul, praying with Paul, and with the other people. And then all of a sudden, he's leaving Paul's ministry and going back into, into the world. Paul didn't see that. God did not reveal that to Paul until, until it happened. 
At least we're not told he did. So Demas, that would Demas would be, I believe, someone that would fit in the second category. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty twenty one. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, and the latter end is worse than them than the beginning. <laughs> 